So today we will learn about the difference between traditional research and action research. This is very important so that you will be able to do your role uh, as a IAR advisor uh, properly, you know, without uh, being um, without being constrained okay, by our traditional notions of what research is all about. So as I was mentioning earlier, in traditional research, the research problem is typically de defined by the researcher prior to the execution of the study or the project. Okay, we are familiar with this. But when we talk about action research, uh, there is no defined problem at the beginning. Because when we are in an organization, there are an array of issues that we confront and issues are emergent. Uh, so whatever your advisee will decide uh, to work on as his or her action research project will depend on the results of his or her consultation and dialogue with his co-workers. That is what we mean when we talk about joint constructing of the issue. So um, they might decide on a particular issue today but after they gather some information or become more aware of the nature of the issue, okay, the questions might change uh, maybe a few weeks from now. And that is where some frustration uh, comes from the point of view of our students because uh, they feel like uh, they're being uh, delayed, no? uh, that they're repeating all over again, and they might not be able to finish their action research uh, within their... Um, uh, ideal timetable. But we explain to them that this is the reality when we deal with problems or issues within an organization. We cannot insist on a particular issue that we like if our co-workers think that that is not important or that there is something that we need to address uh, instead. All right. So uh, we must be clear no, that uh, the issues will not be clear at the onset. And this is the, the default. No? This is more common uh, rather than an issue that is already uh, predetermined at the beginning. Number two, the primary goal of traditional research is uh, to seek understanding of a phenomenon by testing hypothesized relationships. And that is why we typically use statistical analysis to uh, to say whether our hypotheses are validated or, or not. When we talk about action research, the primary goal is to seek uh, to gain a holistic understanding of an organizational issue. No? All of the different, the myriad factors that uh, contribute to it, and then from there, come up with an intervention that can result in a change for the better. Okay? So, uh, does it mean that there's no hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing in action research? Yes, there is, but it is a different form of hypothesis testing that, that does not really that does not necessarily uh, lend lend itself to statistical testing. Number three, traditional research, uh, the structure, uh, the research method for traditional research is structured. And typically, the researcher seeks the control for extraneous variables. Okay, so that is why we have a framework that sets the parameters or limits the, the scope of the study at the very beginning. Okay, but when we talk about action research, the research method is flexible. And again, this might be where some discomfort might come in for the new advisors because we are used to uh, being. Uh, of having a structured, let's say, questionnaire, which we can simply process once we have uh, once we have gathered the data that we have, I don't know, that that we undertook to take. But uh, when we talk about action research, we will need to be flexible about our methods because as we go along the way, our understanding of the issue changes. No? Our appreciation of the conditions uh, also change. No? So. Um, the researchers must be uh, must reflect upon the actions that they take. They must continuously talk to people and then make certain adjustments along the way. Now, the implication for this is that we cannot have a framework at the onset because the framework will depend on what are the issues that will emerge over time. No? And as we know, there are what we call descriptive frameworks and causal frameworks, et cetera. So in action research, 
it is possible that we will be using multiple frameworks that will address various facets of a very complex of a very complex issue. So again, that might be a cause of discomfort for, for some. Now, in traditional research, objectivity is valued. Okay, And even when I talk to my uh, action research students and even to my own advices, it will almost always come into, no, no, uh, come into the conversation that we want to reduce bias or subjectivity, etc. No? But when we talk about action research, we must embrace subjectivity. Just like other forms of qualitative research, uh, there is some element of meaning making that comes into play. And people, because of our differences, will of course have different ways of looking at the world. And therefore, subjectivity is inevitable. But the important thing is that we understand where our subjectivity comes from. So that we will see, we will understand why this person thinks this way. We will also be able to think about uh, why we think about an issue a particular way. No? What are the things about our background, our values, okay, our beliefs that influence the way that we look at a thing that is different from that of another person? All right. Under traditional research, the researcher detaches herself from what she is studying. Okay, which is uh, related to the previous point. But in action research, the researcher seeks to influence the situation towards worthwhile uh, goals or objectives. And then under traditional research, rigor is reckoned in terms of validity, reliability, and generalizability. Okay, and uh, there might be a tendency for us to actually uh, utilize these terms when looking at the papers of our uh, advices. But uh, for action research, uh, the quality of their papers must be reckoned in different terms. That is, in terms of whether they do iterative reflection. Do they think about their decisions and actions constantly? Did they show evidence that they collaborated with people that are also affected by the issue? Okay, So we must also be able to take a look at their manuscript and see whether there is a documentation of a plural plurality of knowing and also whether there are uh, meaningful outcomes of their action research interventions. So given all these uh, differences between the two types of research, there are implications for the action researcher, which is our uh, who are our advisors and their co-workers. Number one, they must learn how to reflect about their actions and behavior. Number two, they must learn how to collaborate with others. Number three, they must be open to a variety of viewpoints. And this might be difficult, let's say, for action researchers who are in certain positions of authority in their organizations. No? Sometimes they think that I know better than my subordinates or that I know better no, in relation to, uh, to my coworkers that are at the lower levels of the organization. This is not necessarily uh, the case. Number four, uh, the action researcher must view things in a holistic manner. That is because we are doing research in the field. Okay, We will not be able to control for certain variables. No? All of these vari variables will come into play in the workplace, and we must be able to come up with a, a way by which we will be able to take into account uh, the possible uh, interactions of these different variables. Number five, the action researcher must be able to advocate change, but without forgetting no, that he must constantly inquire about things that are happening around. Number six, he must be resourceful when faced with constraints. And we know that this is true okay, for any type of organization. Okay, sometimes they will find it difficult to, to move forward with their action research. But since uh, this is an issue that needs to be addressed, in the organization, they will have to find ways or they might need to make certain compromises okay, just so things will be moving forward. Okay, So they might be taking action that is less than ideal, but if it's better than not taking action at all. All right. And then finally, the action researcher must be comfortable with uncertain, uncertainty and change. Now, as, as advisors of these uh, of these students, we must also 
in a way, uh, exhibit all of these different characteristics when dealing with them. So uh, in short, when our students do their action research, they, the way that they understand the organization is enhanced when they actually try to introduce change. Okay? Um, it is unlike traditional research where we seek to understand the relationships of variables first before we propose a recommendation or a, an intervention. In action research, oftentimes we will have to try out okay, certain things, certain uh, actions, even if we are not yet 100% uh, sure, no? and even if we are not yet certain that this will succeed. But later on, we can try and uh, refine our action so that uh, things become better. So another quotation, any change, even a change for the better, is always accompanied by discomfort. So we must be able to guide our students so that uh, we will be able to give them the courage and strength to continue okay, uh, with their action research in spite of the difficulties that they confront. Now. What is our role as an advisor? Okay, take a look at these uh, items. No? Uh, number one, uh, as advisors, we must try to see the organization from the eyes of our advisees and of their coworkers because they are the ones confronting the issues and challenges at hand. Meaning that we must listen to the stories no, of our advisees because they are the ones who are there, no? so that we will have better understanding of what they are uh, confronted with. Number two, we must be able to guide our advisees to the different steps of the action research cycle, namely the constructing, planning, taking action, and evaluating action. Okay, so for the advisors, for new advisors, probably the most difficult to comprehend or to appreciate will be the constructing phase. And, uh, uh, we will uh, constantly uh, provide you with the tools that you will need uh, for you to be able to appreciate this particular phase uh, well. And uh, if you will notice in sample action research uh, papers, this particular stage actually takes up uh, a chunk uh, of the manuscript because the uh, advices will have to explain uh, the process by which they were able to come up with an issue that they have jointly Agreed, uh, agreed upon okay, with their collaborators. Number three, uh, we must ask questions to help our advisees make sense of their experience in enacting the AR cycles in their organization. So this will be the focus of our session uh, this morning about uh, asking questions or second person inquiry. Number four, we must assess the competency of our advisees in utilizing the different tools associated with first person, second person, and third person inquiry. Now, we will only be able to assess the competency of our advisees uh, on these tools if we also understand okay, what these different tools are. So for today, we will touch on second person. Um, next week, we will talk about first person, uh, first person inquiry tools. Uh, when we talk about third person inquiry, this is basically, uh, in simple terms, utilizing existing frameworks okay, that we can now apply to our workplace. This is something that I think most of us are familiar with being uh, doctors. Number five, we must engage our advices in regular conversations and serve as a sounding board for ideas and concerns about the conduct and progress of their action research projects. Now, um, I know that all of us are very busy, but we must be able to find time to talk to our advisees. It's not enough that we simply take a look at their paper and comment on it, because a lot of insights can be generated through uh, a dialogue, through a conversation, and through skillful inquiry on the part of the advisor. Uh, that will help the advisee no, uh, clarify uh, his or her own thinking. So uh, for uh, our minimum number of meetings for our advisees for a term will be four, but uh, you must be able to use your judgment about uh, how many times we might need to meet certain individuals depending on the nature or complexity of their uh, action research project. So it will be different for different people. No? Some students are very bright, very quick. They're able to finish their paper uh, 
uh, quickly. Uh, a very brief conversation can lead to very quick uh, comprehension and insight. So you're lucky if you were able to get an advice, advice like that. But there are some advices who will take a little more time to comprehend. Na pa ulit ulit ka na hindi pa rin nakukuha until after uh, a certain ano no, until the spark actually comes ano no, comes in into play. And finally, we must also be able to recommend readings and resources and suggest frameworks that might be relevant to our advices after research. But we will all uh, only be able to identify these frameworks or resources. Uh, once the issue becomes a little bit more concrete, it okay, becomes more uh, comprehensible from the point of view of our advising. So the best teachers are those who show you where to look but don't tell you what to see. So I just wanted to highlight this uh, quotation because as you see now, um, it is not um, we just don't tell them what to do, okay? Our students must be able to figure it out uh, for themselves because that is the, the essence of being a reflective practitioner. So I came up with a uh, table about bad, okay, in quotes, versus good IR advising. Okay, I just wanted to use those terms now because it's more, I don't know, it's a, it has a stronger punch. So number one, uh, we don't want to tell our advisees what they should do, much less prescribe formulaic uh, solutions that do not consider context because we do not know the context of the organization. Now, good advising would take the form of posing questions okay, to help the advisee figure out how to address the problems on his own. So that is where the second person inquiry tools will uh, will be helpful. We should in fact, of all of the different tools, as advisors, we should be very skilled in terms of the second person inquiry tools. Number two, and this might be difficult for, uh, for many of us because we feel like we are the experts na, in our field, but uh, that's a very dangerous uh, stance to take. Instead, uh, if we want to be good advisors, we must facilitate learning through skillful, a skillful inquiry. Number three, uh, we advise you against simply reading and commenting on your advice's drafts, although I would think that there might be constraints for some, but uh, we would strongly encourage you to engage your advice in regular conversations. Now, this just came into mind uh, because uh, uh, most of us will be handling multiple advices. In my case, I'm handling about eight advices uh, at, at one time. Uh, so what I do is that I meet uh, for the initial stages, I meet them together, and then uh, we engage in some sort of uh, sharing of their uh, problems, and then we can choose one or two of them to share, and then I can give them certain directions that they can take. Because oftentimes, what might be useful for a particular advisee might, must, uh, uh, will also be useful to another advisee. So there are certain stages in the advising process where it will be helpful to have your advices together because number one, okay, you will be able to tell them uh, certain things at the same time if it's uh, things that they need to know together. Secondly, having them work together or in one group uh, serves as a uh, support uh, group. It becomes a support mechanism for them. So in my experience, many of my advisees who are batchmates would typically help each other out. There would usually be one or two who are very skilled in that uh, in that group. And this one serves as a second advisor in a way no? because the person simply gets it. And then there, were, there, there will be certain people within the group that will also, let's say, fulfill the social function, make people laugh. So they uh, look forward to actually uh, meeting each other every week. And then they also um, interact with each other even uh, without me. Uh, so that will be a good way by which they will be able to uh, sustain their, uh, their interest and finish their AR project. Number four, uh, let's not be quick to judge actions taken by the advisee and uh, his co-researchers without understanding contextual factors. Sometimes our advice you know, will be taking the uh, action that we don't seem to agree with. Parabang obvious naman that this is the wrong decision. 
but they would still do it anyway. No? Uh, we must understand where this is coming from. There could be some political concerns within the organization. There could be pressures from the boss. All right. There might be pressures in terms of meeting certain deliverables okay, to get a raise or a promotion. So all of, the, all of these things come into play. So our role now is to help our students reflect upon the actions that they take, especially those that we think might not be the most ideal. Okay, and then that must be reflected somehow in the in the manuscript through their meta reflections. So you can now see na, how the way that we do advising and action research is very different from traditional advising for theses or for dissertation. So we must remember that our students are treading very new ground, uh, especially when they introduce change in an organization that might not be too open okay, to, uh, to changes. And therefore, it is inevitable that uh, some of them will actually make mistakes. And therefore, we, uh, we must be understanding about why these things happen. Okay? All of us are human. All of us make mistakes. But the important thing is that we learn from the mistakes as we go through and enact the action research cycle so that we become better persons uh, in the process. Okay, so some of the, our students will uh, persist and persevere and try to uh, get the change going within the organization. Some of them will try their best and see that it is a hopeless organization and not that you would actually decide you not know, to actually lead the organization for better pastures. Uh, elsewhere. But again, as advisors, we must still be able to help them process okay, their decisions, whether they decide to stay in the organization or whether they decide that they will leave okay, their organizations now for, for another, for a better employer. So let me end uh, this uh, session uh, through these two quotations. Success is a journey, not a destination. The doing is often more important than the outcome. So the action research paper must include a very thorough description of the process okay, that the students underwent and not only the outcome of their interventions. So uh, sometimes it's the journey that teaches you a lot about your destination. All right. So that's the first part of our session.